This sermon was preached on February 20th, 2022 at Jerseyville Baptist Church and is entitled, Serve One Another. For our first scripture reading, I will read John chapter 13, verses 1 to 17. It was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God, and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that is why he said, Not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your teacher, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do, as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is the messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Amen. For our next scripture reading, I will read Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 to 26. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh, and these are in conflict with each other, so that you, do, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Amen. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts and our lives. Freedom is a word on everybody's lips today. That is a quote I read this week. I did not read it on a recent blog post or contemporary article, but in one of my commentaries on Galatians 5. The commentary was written by John Stott in 1968. They talked about the concept of freedom in the early church as seen in Paul's letters. They talked about it 50 years ago, and it is definitely on the lips of people today. Freedom. There are, of course, many different types of and aspects to freedom. Political freedom, economic freedom, civil freedom, freedom of speech, among others. When you ask the question, what does it mean to be free, depending on who you ask and the context, you will get many different answers. In this verse, Galatians 5.13, Paul is speaking about spiritual or Christian freedom. Though Paul knew times of imprisonment, though he was familiar with chains, 
He says that he is free in Christ. Christ has liberated him and freed his soul. He is free from the demands of the law, free from the controlling power of the flesh, and free to do the high and great work for Jesus by the power of the Spirit. I am free, Paul says, to serve my brothers and sisters in the Lord. I am free to serve my fellow believers in the manner that I learned from the Lord Jesus Christ, who on the night that he was betrayed took up the basin and the towel. Jesus showed us how to serve. The Son of God lay aside his divine privileges and humbly came to earth in the form of a servant. And we are to follow the pattern of our Lord and Savior. Paul's teaching here is that we are free in Christ to follow his example and to show love to one another through acts of service. The one another for today is serve one another. Galatians 5.13 You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, Rather, serve one another humbly in love. The questions of application from this text are clear. Do I serve? Do I serve in a Christ-like manner with a Christ-like attitude? We begin with the call to serve. Paul, in this verse, links freedom and service. He says that they were called to be free. There is freedom for those whom God has called to salvation a liberty enjoyed by believers who are redeemed by grace and who do not seek to find acceptance before God by doing the works of the law. Paul's point in the early part of this chapter is that we have been freed from the impossible weight of trying to achieve God's favor. We have been freed from that in Christ. But though you are free, Though there is not a list of rules that you must keep in order to be saved, do not use your freedom selfishly. Do not think of yourself first. Do not view your freedom as an opportunity to gratify the desires of your flesh. Some wrongly opposed Paul's teaching, declaring that this freedom in Christ that he talks about will encourage people to sin. Paul says that's not the case. To have that sort of argument means that you don't understand God's grace and what freedom in Christ means. We have been set free by Christ for a purpose, not to sin, but to live for Jesus. Paul calls on believers to use your freedom in Christ to serve others. Do not serve yourselves, but think about how you can bless other people. This is the Christ-like priority. A few chapters earlier, Galatians 2.20, Paul wrote, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul says that he has been crucified with Christ. He has died to his old, selfish, sinful way of living. And now Christ, the servant king, lives in him. And so he lives a life of service to God and to others by faith. Christ has saved him and called him to serve. Christ has saved us and called us to be free so that we might serve. As Paul dictated this letter, when he came to this verse, there are two words that occur frequently in the New Testament that he could have used in this exhortation to serve. The first of these words is diakonos, which means servant, and it's the word that we get the word deacon from. And it may refer to a literal servant or to a person who acts as a servant, but is not technically a servant. In Matthew 20, 26, Jesus says to his disciples, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Jesus contrasts how his followers are to conduct themselves with the proud Pharisees. Don't be like the Pharisees who want to lord it over other people, but you are to serve one another. And it would have been completely appropriate for Paul to use that word here, but he didn't. He chose a stronger Greek word, the word doulos. And the term doulos can mean 
slave, or servant, depending on the context. And what this word suggests is that one is either involuntarily or by choice in a strongly subservient position to another. And that is what Paul calls the Galatians to do. To, in our Christian freedom, voluntarily take a subservient position to our brothers and sisters in the Lord because we love them and because we love Jesus. Martin Luther wrote, A Christian is free and independent in every aspect, a bondservant to none. So emphasizing this idea of Christian liberty. And then he continues saying, A Christian is a dutiful servant in every respect, owing a duty to everyone. Christians are free, free to serve, owing a duty to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith for the glory of Jesus. Jesus is magnified when we serve. By nature, we look out for our own interests. But when we selflessly serve one another for Jesus' sake, we show how much we value Jesus, how thankful we are to him for his death on the cross, and we reveal how powerful he is, having transformed us and our desires. So we are called to serve one another. Well, let us now turn to some biblical illustrations of what this looks like in action. And when you think of those who had a servant attitude in the scripture, who comes to mind? Whose selflessness can we, can you, emulate? And I don't know about you, but there's a lot of individuals that, that come to mind. There's Moses, the meek and reluctant leader who faithfully served God's people as leader, judge, and intercessor. Nehemiah, the passionate cupbearer of the king, who left his comfortable position due to his grief at the state of Jerusalem, knowing that something must be done for God's glory and for God's people. Ruth, the faithful daughter-in-law, who sacrificed everything that this world had to offer for the sake of Naomi. There are many good examples of those who endure difficulties of all sorts because of their commitment to serving others. But let us think for a few minutes about the apostles of Jesus Christ. Those who wrote the epistles frequently referred to themselves as slaves of Jesus, using the word that Paul employs here in our verse. They identified as those who were called to serve Jesus and his people, and they demonstrated what service looks like in their lives. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants, slaves of Jesus Christ. This is who I am, Paul says. I am a slave of Jesus. And then later on in the same letter, Paul writes about Timothy, that he has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. This is the family business. Paul and Timothy labored in as servants for Jesus in the work of the gospel. And what did this mean for them? Well, they sacrificed their freedoms, their comfort, the treasures of this world, and even their lives. They were both martyred for the sake of other people so that others would hear the gospel. Charles Spurgeon writes, If the service of God is worth anything, it is worth everything. And that is the attitude which motivated Paul. The service of God is worth everything. And so he willingly endured great hardship. He was beaten, stoned, hungry at times, and frequently exhausted because he loved Jesus so much and he wanted to serve him by serving his people. Remember on the road to Damascus, Jesus asked Paul, why are you persecuting me? When you persecute a follower of Jesus, when you persecute the church, Jesus says, you're actually persecuting me. Well, likewise, when you serve even the least of Jesus' followers, you are serving him. Paul understood that, and he committed his life to faithful service of Jesus and the church. But he was not the only apostle to refer to himself as a servant slave. In the opening of his letter, James also emphasized 
his role and position as a servant. James 1.1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, who is James? He is the biological half-brother of Jesus Christ, the son of Joseph and Mary. He is a key leader in the church in Jerusalem. And yet, in his description of himself, he doesn't highlight that, but he says that he is a servant. A servant of God and of Jesus. One who is called to serve his Lord and the church. And that is what James did. James is the one who is referred to as camel knees because his knees were so calloused and worn out because he spent so much time in prayer. That was his heart. And likewise, Peter opens his second letter with the words, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Peter was called to serve. He remembered that Jesus, on the beach all those years ago, had told him to take care of his lambs, to feed the sheep. Peter was called by Jesus to serve God's people, and that is what he did. He was a passionate preacher of the truth and sought to humbly and tenderly care for and tend to the flock of Jesus that had been entrusted to him. And then he exhorts other church leaders to do the same, 1 Peter 5. The leaders and missionaries in the early church identified themselves as servants, as slaves. For them, the concept of service was so important because they knew that their king, their savior had come not to be served, but to serve. When they thought of Jesus, they thought of one who had a servant heart. Jesus' mission to serve others was evident on the night of his betrayal when he washed the feet of the disciples. We read that stunning passage earlier when Jesus got up from the table to do the lowliest of tasks. He performed the act of a humble servant washing the feet of the disciples. None of the disciples got up. None of them were willing to demean themselves and do that role. But Jesus, the master, did. After Jesus had served them so tenderly, so graciously, and so beautifully, he said, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, No servant is greater than his master, nor is the messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus made it clear to his disciples that when he washed their feet, he was setting an example for them. They were to serve one another. They were to wash each other's feet. And they were to do it willingly, taking the position of a slave for the good of their brothers and sisters in the Lord. They were to hold nothing back because Jesus didn't hold anything back. The service that he offered for others went beyond washing feet. A short time after that event, he laid down his life on the cross for sinners. He was sacrificed for our transgressions. Jesus' death on the cross was the greatest act of service ever done. The Son of God took on flesh, and became a bondservant that he might lay down his life for others. He died in the place of sinners so that by his blood we might be cleansed. By his stripes we might be healed. May we treasure the sacrifice of Jesus. May we believe in him for eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. And may we follow his example of service. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters, John writes. So what then are we to do? We are to serve one another. We are to follow the pattern of Jesus Christ. We are to be good stewards of that which God has entrusted to us, to use for the blessing of one another. So what does service look like today? How are we to serve in the church? The scripture is clear and consistent. We are to serve one another. The focus of this command in Galatians 5 and of our sermon series 
in general has been on how we are to treat our fellow believers. We are reflecting on what is to characterize our relationships with one another in the community of faith. That being said, we are, of course, to serve those outside the church as well. We are to be servant-hearted in our community, our families, and the world at large. But for our purposes here, we are focusing on service that we have been called to do for one another, for those who are our brothers and sisters in the Lord. In Paul's discussion in Galatians 5, he has been talking about walking in the Spirit. Every believer has been indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and we are to make every effort to keep in step with him as we live our lives. We are not to resist him or grieve him, but we are to flourish in light of his presence in our lives. The Holy Spirit has been given to all believers, and he has given gifts to every individual, which are to be used in the church. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit has been given for the common good. The manifestation of the Spirit that Paul is referring to are the spiritual gifts which have been divinely poured out on every believer designed to bless and edify the community of faith. Throughout the New Testament, a number of gifts of the Spirit are listed. Leadership, administration, teaching, helps, hospitality, encouragement, and so on. And generally speaking, we serve one another by using the gifts and abilities given to us by God for the good of others. The call to serve one another is a call to actively use our spiritual gifts for the good of others. We are not to be like the unfaithful servant who buried his talents, but we are to put our talents to work for Jesus' sake. In addition to the call for believers to serve one another by using our spiritual gifts, let us look at some specific ways in which we are called to serve. These are some of the additional one another commands that we find in the scripture. We serve one another by bearing one another's burdens. Galatians 6.2 Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ, Paul tells us in Galatians, is the command to love our neighbors as ourselves. And we fulfill this by burying by bearing or carrying one another's burdens. We are to share the load that our brother or sister is carrying. And you can picture in your mind's eye an individual struggling under the weight of a backpack. And it's always a little bit humorous when you see the kids in JK you know, walking to school with their massive backpacks. Um, now for them, frequently their backpacks aren't very, hung- aren't very heavy. But picture an individual who has this huge backpack on and it's weighing them down and they can hardly move. And what are we to do? Well, we're to come alongside them and we're to help them bear the load, offer up our shoulder and carry it with them. That's what Paul is illustrating. Bear one another's burdens, help each other out so that they will not be crushed by the tragedy or the circumstance that they are dealing with. We are to be quick to look for other people who are struggling under the burden of their lives and then take the step to help them carry the load. And this can involve being a listening ear, making a meal, looking after children, speaking a timely word of encouragement, providing financial support, helping with the home repair. There's all sorts of things that we can do. And of course, in and through this all, we pray. We pray for one another. And if you are struggling under a load, then do not be ashamed to accept help. And this is one of the beauties of the church. We get to help each other out. Even when we do something simple like offering up a cup of cold water to a believer in need, we are doing it unto the Lord. So whose load can you help carry? We serve one another by bearing one another's burdens. We serve one another by showing hospitality to one another. 1 Peter 4, 9. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. We are social beings. We need fellowship 
it is good to spend time with one another, encouraging each other in the faith. So we are called to show hospitality to one another. And for some people, this comes naturally. It is their spiritual gifting. They love to have people over, and they have a home that seems designed for hospitality. And though some are especially gifted at showing hospitality, this is a call that goes out to all of us. We are all to look for ways to show welcoming love to one another and to strengthen the bond that binds us together. And we are to do so without grumbling. Showing hospitality can be inconvenient. It can be costly in terms of time or resources. But we are to remember that it is our pleasure to serve one another in this way. And as the writer of Hebrews says, when, so, when some showed hospitality, thinking of Abraham, uh, they have unwittingly entertained angels. So who can you be hospitable toward? Further, we serve one another by doing good for one another. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.15, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. And this is such a broad exhortation. There are so many things that can fall under the category of intentionally doing good for another individual. Over the past few years, we have been blessed as a family in a number of creative and thoughtful ways by those who have done good for us. So use your imagination when it comes to thinking of ways to do good and be intentional about it. Uh, here's a story that I read this week. A pastor and another person went out to lunch during a Bible conference. After they had finished lunch, the pastor went to pay the bill, but was told the bill had already been paid. Already paid? At first, the pastor thought his colleague had paid, but the waitress said a gentleman across the room had paid for it. When the pastor went to thank the gentleman, he said, I'm also at the conference, and I saw that you took this other guy out to lunch to minister to him. And so I just wanted to do good. This, the man was on the hunt to do good. And so like him, we should always be wanting to do good for one another, actively looking for ways to do so. Doing good for one another does not necessarily require a lot of money or time, but it does require thoughtfulness and care. Let us serve one another by doing good. So what good can you do? for a brother or sister in the Lord this week? Who can you send a card to or give a call to? And I also want to note that we serve one another by doing many of the things that we have already looked at in this sermon series. These one another's frequently overlap. We are lovingly serving one another when we instruct one another, when we encourage one another, when we build up one another, and so forth. So let us prioritize these things and remember the application of two weeks ago when I encouraged you before you leave this place to seek to build up one another by sharing with someone a verse or a comforting truth about Jesus. And one final area of service is that we serve one another by praying for one another. Praying for one another is important. And we will spend next week, Lord willing, looking at this one another as we read of it in James 5.16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Well, let us serve one another through prayer. Brother, sister, let me be your servant. Let me be as Christ to you. Let us serve one another. Let us remember the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, who humbly washed the feet of his disciples and then provided the ultimate example of service by dying in their place, on, in our place, on the cross. And let us serve each other by prayer, in our words and in our actions. Let us be creative in looking for ways to serve one another. Let us use our spiritual gifts in the interest of our brothers and sisters. Let us do all of this to bless our brothers and sisters in the Lord so that they might thrive, so that the unity of the church might be enhanced, and so that Jesus Christ will be exalted and the Father 
glorified. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of the church, and we thank you for the gift of brothers and sisters in the Lord. And there are so many wonderful things about being part of a community of faith. And we do pray that you would help us to have a servant heart towards each other. Help us to be actively looking for ways that we can minister. And our Father, give us the courage to put these things into practice. And our Father, we pray that you would bind our congregation together in love. Love for the Lord Jesus Christ and love for another. We pray in his precious name.